The subcommittee will come to order. The Strategic Forces Subcommittee will have a hearing today on U.S. and adversary hypersonic capabilities. The purpose of this hearing is to review the policies, programs, and priorities associated with U.S. hypersonic capabilities and explore the capabilities and intent of adversaries' hypersonic development efforts. I ask first unanimous consent that non-subcommittee members be allowed to participate in today's hearing after all submitting Subcommittee members have had an opportunity to ask questions. Is there any objection? Without objection, non-subcommittee members will be recognized at the appropriate time for five minutes. So good afternoon to our witnesses, uh, Dr. Horowitz, Dr. Weber, Vice Admiral Wolf, Lieutenant General Rash, Lieutenant General White, and Mr. McCormick. We are also joined by Mr. Rumford, the director of the Test Resource Management Center, who will not have a separate opening statement, but will be available to answer questions. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you for your service. This is a very important topic. This is now the second hearing this subcommittee has had on hypersonic capabilities, one of the most pressing issues for our national defense. China and Russia continue their own program developments at a breathtaking pace. In the time since our last subcommittee hearing on this subject, the Joint Army-Navy program has had several unsuccessful test events, and the Air Force has continued to struggle with aero. I appreciate the work your teams are doing to identify and fix the malfunctions that caused the unsuccessful flight tests and get the programs on track to field these critical capabilities. However, at this point, we are still well behind our adversaries, even if everything goes as planned. I have a remainder of the opening statement, but for the sake of time, I am going to submit it for the record. And I will point out that in about an two hours' time, we'll have a vote series on the floor. I hope to be all done with our public and our classified upstairs portion of the hearing so that all the witnesses can go on their way and we will go on to our votes and be done for the day. So. For that purpose, I will probably only have time for one round of questions, and um, uh, then we will adjourn and quickly go into a classified portion at that point in time. But I want to see if the ranking member has any opening statement he would like to make. Sure, Mr. Chairman. I have to start by saying I'm quite jealous that you'll be done for the day at the end of votes. <laughs> That's not what my calendar looks like this evening. But uh, thank you very much. I also want to extend a warm welcome to our distinguished panel of witnesses today. And I'm thankful that we are holding this hearing on hypersonics, not only to understand our adversaries' capabilities and intentions when it comes to these weapons, but also to gain a better understanding of how the department envisions the employment of our own hypersonics in a future conflict. In the year, almost to the day, since our last hearing on hypersonics, we've seen war criminal Vladimir Putin employ hypersonic weapons in his criminal war against Ukraine. The CCP continues to test novel and more advanced hypersonics, and North Korea now purports to have them as well. This all started when America pulled out of the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, which had effectively limited the development of any new strategic capabilities beyond our existing triad since the 1970s. Our adversaries have clearly determined that being able to surprise us with extremely fast, highly maneuverable weapons that are hard to detect is critical to defeating U.S. missile defense systems. From a technological perspective, the Pentagon's work on hypersonics has seen some positive developments over the past year. <clears throat> the services are tapping into non-traditional industry to solve challenges like new thermal <clears throat> protection systems, solid rocket motors, and software. I'm also encouraged at programs like Mach-TB that are bringing in innovative ways to test components and systems more quickly, getting closer to something we have been pushing the department to do, not be afraid to fail, and in fact, to fail faster, learn faster, and pivot, pivot quickly from mistakes. We've also seen great strides in domain awareness. This past year, both the hypersonic and ballistic tracking space center and Tranche 1 missile warning prototype satellites have been placed into orbit, their future operational constellations being critical for our defense and decision making. There remain, however, significant fundamental concerns with the program. One of the top conclusions of the Bipartisan Future of Defense Task Force that I co-chaired in 2020 is that it's not enough for the Pentagon to pursue technology for technology's sake. We need to develop the operational concepts for how that technology will actually be employed. 
Indeed, the operational concept should come first, and then we should develop whatever technology is needed to best address the need. Over the past few years, I've asked this most basic question of department officials. How will you use these hypersonic weapons that are costing taxpayers hundreds of billions of dollars to build? Several times, I have been met with blank stares, literally blank stares. So last year, we directed the Pentagon to tell us with a simple report explaining the concepts of operations and total misses, missiles needed for offensive hypersonic systems. This committee was just told that, quote, more time is needed to collect and integrate inputs from all relevant stakeholders. We anticipate delivering the report by December 31st, 2024. This fundamental confusion is shocking. Let me be clear, the Department of Defense cannot clearly explain to Congress and the American people the rationale for developing these weapons for the past four years at the cost of $15 billion and is now asking for an additional $3 billion for the 2025 budget. I mean, I'm curious if ever before in the history of the Pentagon we spent billions developing a weapon we don't know how to use. Absent any plans from the Pentagon, some generals and admirals in your seats here have tried to answer this most basic question by saying that hypersonics will be a strategic deterrent, yet there's no plan to arm them with strategic warheads. And is the hope that we never use them? That doesn't seem consistent with what we've heard. Others have implied they will serve as next generation cruise missiles, harder to counter than our ubiquitous tomahawks. Such an answer seems to me both simple and believable, and yet apparently this is not true because I can't imagine it would take five years to provide a four-word answer. Others have said that we need them simply because our adversaries have them. Well, there are plenty of weapons our adversaries are developing that we are not, for good reason. Russia's recently leaked space weapon comes to mind. I saw carrier pigeons employed in Iraq not long ago. I assume we're not developing them too. Being unable to answer this alarmingly simple question, how will we use hypersonics, may expose an even greater concern that we are developing a weapon that is seriously destabilizing, a weapon that will ultimately make us and the world less safe and secure. This would be notably in contrast to the rest of our nuclear triad. Sure, I wish we didn't have to have intercontinental ballistic missiles, but I support investing in them because they provide strategic stability and have been a cornerstone of that strategic stability for decades, as our experience with Russia has proven. But if a nation, us or them, cannot tell whether an inbound hypersonic missile is a strategic nuclear weapon or not, or simply where it is aimed, that nation could feel compelled to launch a nuclear response, and nuclear holocaust could be the result. Obviously, we need answers. The bottom line is that we have a lot of work to do, and I hope today, today's hearing will, for the first time, help answer some of these fundamental questions to give us better insight into whether developing hypersonic weapons will make us safer or whether they will prove to be an epic multi-billion dollar mistake that hopefully doesn't inadvertently spark a nuclear holocaust. Well, I hope the ranking member asked the right questions to get to the bottom of the issues that he's having trouble with, so you'll have that opportunity here soon. I'll make an editorial comment right now and say that I believe it's destabilizing for China and Russia to have a major capability that we do not have, and that there are problem sets and target sets that can only be addressed through this capability. So that's, that's the kind of thing we should have a good debate and discussion during this important hearing today. We will now turn to our witnesses. Your prepared statements will be made part of the record. Since we have such a full house, I will ask each of you to please limit your opening comments to four minutes. We have a very distinguished panel, and we'll start with Dr. Horwitz. You're recognized first. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Lam Lambord, Ranking Member Moulton, members of the subcommittee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm honored to be here to speak about the department's policy regarding hypersonic weapons. The 2022 National Defense Strategy outlines four core priorities and serves as our North Star. Defending the homeland, pace to the multi-domain threat posed by the People's Republic of China, deterring strategic attacks against the United States, our allies and partners, deterring aggression while being prepared to prevail in conflict when necessary, and building a resilient joint force and defense ecosystem. U.S. development of hypersonic systems supports integrated deterrence 
against the priority challenges identified in the National Defense Strategy. The Department continues to focus on developing conventionally armed systems that can contribute to long-range strike within a designated theater area of responsibility. The Department's offensive hypersonic weapons development is driven by a need to provide a full range of options to senior decision makers. Hypersonics are a key component in the mix of capabilities that the Joint Force needs to deter and, if necessary, defeat aggression. We are continuing to invest in and accelerate the delivery of these capabilities to the warfighter. More broadly, the Department is also making substantial investments in a range of conventionally armed offensive hypersonics from the air to undersea. This is critical to enhancing deterrence. It's also important for the Department to continue developing capabilities to defend against hypersonic threats. The Department is continuing its efforts to develop active and passive defenses against regional hypersonic missile threats and to pursue a persistent and resilient sensor network to characterize and track hypersonic threats, improve attribution, and enable engagement. In conclusion, DOD is focusing on fielding the right mix of capabilities to generate the effects that we need to deter and, if necessary, prevail in any conflict. Hypersonics, because of their characteristics, represent a key element in this mix of capabilities. Delivering those capabilities in concert with a network of allies and partners and in parallel with other advanced technologies and new operating concepts for the force as a whole will ensure that DOD maintains the ability to deter potential adversaries and to defeat aggression if necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Weber. Chairman Lam Lamborn, Ranking Member Moulton, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting us to provide testimony before the House Armed Services Committee, Subcommittee on Strategic Forces hearing on U.S. and adversary hypersonic programs. I serve as the Principal Director for Hypersonics in the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. I'm also happy to introduce my research and engineering colleague to my left, Mr. George Rumford, the director of the Test Resource Management Center. Today we are here because the United States faces unprecedented challenges in national security. The PRC and Russia have deployed high-end defensive and anti-access systems that will challenge our ability to deter adversaries and defend U.S. forces, allies, and partners against rapid military interventions. To address these challenges, the Department of Defense is accelerating the development and delivery of hypersonic systems that provide responsive, survivable, and lethal capabilities to our warfighter. Our strategic approach to delivering these capabilities is focused on four priorities. First, demonstrate and transition hypersonic systems through rapid design, build, test, and learn cycles. Second, reduce the cost of hypersonic systems and increase industrial capability to build warfighting inventories. Third, grow and sustain our critical enablers to accelerate the development of current and future hypersonic systems. These enablers are test and evaluation, science and technology, workforce development, and allied partnerships. Fourth, identify, develop, and demonstrate next generation capabilities. Thanks to the resources Congress has provided, the Department is developing a range of hypersonic and counter-hypersonic capabilities for our warfighters that will hold time-critical and heavily defended targets at risk from survivable standoff range and defend the U.S. homeland, warfighters abroad, allies, and partners against adversary hypersonic threats. Consistent with the direction in the FY 2017 National Defense Authorization Act, the Department is taking risks, pressing the technology envelope, and increasing test and experimentation to accelerate the development of hypersonic technologies and systems. The Department is using the middle tier acquisition authorities provided by Congress to streamline and accelerate the development of five hypersonic strike weapon prototypes. Three programs, including the Air Force Air Launch Rapid Response Weapon, the Army Long Range Hypersonic Weapon, and the Navy Conventional Prompt Strike System have already reached flight tests in less than four years. And we are positioned for the United States to field hypersonic weapon capabilities by the mid-2020s. The Department is also accelerating our development of hypersonic systems and capabilities by making significant investments to increase our ground and flight test infrastructure, our domestic manufacturing capabilities and industrial supply chain, and scientists, engineering, and technician workforce. In closing, our nation is now at the threshold of delivering hypersonic systems that will provide transformational capabilities for deterring and defending against future aggression. However, we must maintain our national commitment to this goal to be successful. We appreciate Congress's support to U.S. hypersonics development, and with your continued help, we will fill the hypersonic and counter-hypersonic capabilities the nation needs. Thank you for having us here today to discuss this critical effort, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you, Vice Admiral Wolf. Chairman Lamborn, Ranking Member Moulton, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the Navy's Strategic Systems Program's Conventional Prompt Strike Hypersonic Weapon, known as CPS. 
The Navy and Army are partnered to execute the CPS and long-range hypersonic weapon programs through the use of a common hypersonic missile, which consists of a two-stage missile booster designed, developed, and produced by the Navy, as well as a common hypersonic glide body designed and developed by the Navy and produced by the Army. The CPS and LRHW programs have pursued an aggressive schedule to develop a common hypersonic weapon that will be the Army and Navy's first. By leveraging joint developmental test opportunities, the programs have marked significant testing milestones at a consistent pace, including a March 2020 flight test that demonstrated our common hypersonic glide body technology is mature, and a 2022 flight test that provided vital data on the performance of our newly developed missile booster. Although CPS and LRHW successfully initiated the first flight test of the newly developed weapon system less than four years after the initiation of the programs, recent tests were not completed as expected. In each case, the Navy, Army, government national team, and our contractors has rapidly reacted to identify root causes, complete corrective actions, and expeditiously return to the range. Additionally, our programs have initiated an additional series of design reviews and have planned additional testing opportunities to restore technical confidence, achieve critical knowledge points, and further reduce risk on the path to fielding. As a complement to our planned full weapon system flight test, the programs continue to utilize the multi-service advanced capability hypersonics test bed known as MOC-TB. The MOC-TB program was created in 2022 by CPS and the Naval Warfare Center, Crane, Indiana, leveraging a generous congressional appropriation increase. We have now turned the effort over to OSD's Test Resource Management Center, allowing CPS, LRHW, and the entire hypersonics enterprise to utilize commercial launch platforms for subcomponent, subscale, and full scale tests to increase the rate of testing at a reduced cost. <clears throat> Meanwhile, our hypersonic industry partners are working diligently with the government national team to facilitate a rapid transition to production, platform integration, and delivery to the warfighter. We continue to prioritize improved affordability of the weapon system through initiatives to reduce material costs, including leveraging additive manufacturing and other new production processes. In order to deliver this capability at the speed of relevance, the Army and Navy teams will continue to work closely with our industry partners, OSD, and Congress to identify supply chain issues and put mitigation plans in place. The Navy continues to prepare for the filling of CPS on both the Zumwalt class destroyers and the Block 5 Virginia payload module equipped submarines. Testing at our in-air launch test facility has continued to refine the coal gas launch approach the Navy will use to launch the common hypersonic missile from both our sea platforms. The CPS fielding on Zumwalt class destroyers will mark the first use of this coal gas launch approach on a surface ship platform. Construction and outfitting of the underwater launch test facility continues, and that will allow the program to evaluate how the CPS missile transits through the water using the newly developed CPS launcher. We have conducted a series of exercises that allow our sailors to execute scenarios in an operationally relevant environment and have deployed a weapon system prototype and missile simulator on a Zumwalt class destroyer. The ship took that equipment to sea and we validated that we can demonstrate employment concepts and command and control following tasking by any combatant commander. I'd like to thank Congress for the support you have shown our program and the important focus that you have placed on this essential capability. As the 14th Director, it is my honor to represent the personnel of SSP CPS program. One of my top priorities is to ensure that these dedicated Americans are poised to execute the conventional prompt strike mission with the same level of success, passion, and rigor as we have since SSP was founded. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of the team that will provide our nation with a credible and reliable intermediate range hypersonic strike capability. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral. Lieutenant General Rash. Chairman Lamborn, uh, Ranking Member Moulton, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for allowing me here today to represent the Army uh, to discuss the ongoing development of the long-range hypersonic weapon alongside my colleagues and other services and in the Office of Secretary of Defense. And on behalf of the Army senior leadership, we thank you for your continued support of our soldiers, our civilians, and their families. The responsiveness and survivability of hypersonic weapons is unmatched by traditional ballistic capabilities for precision targeting. 
especially in anti-access area denial environments. The department made the decision to pursue these systems because these weapons provide the United States with a suite of options to strike at strategic targets. My goal as a material developer is to help ensure the United States military can successfully deter and if necessarily defeat and fight our nation's wars. The Army tasked the uh, Rapid Cap Capabilities and Critical Technologies Office with developing the long-range hypersonic weapon on an aggressive timeline. The Army and Navy are closely, in, closely partnered in this endeavor. The Navy's conventional prompt strike program and the Army's long-range hypersonic weapon program share key components such as a common missile booster stack, the use of a common hypersonic glide body, and have aligned developmental efforts and resources. And these commonalities have supported an emerging industrial base in maintaining aggressive development and fielding schedules. In addition to this partnership, both the Army and the Navy have benefited significantly from the work at government labs and with the considerable support from OSD to help ensure this capability gets delivered. Throughout 2023, the Army and Navy conducted three iterations of Joint Flight Campaign Two. While those tests did not go as planned, the Army and Navy teams learned from each of these and worked with industry to make necessary corrective actions to return to the range for further testing. Following the third attempt, both programs worked together to establish multiple lines of effort to conduct a series of design reviews across the weapon system. In close partnership with the Navy, we are pursuing a rigorous test regimen to reduce risk before returning back to flight test. This regimen will ensure incremental success at the subsystem level making necessary adjustments and demonstrating repeated su success, allowing us to return to flight tests with unwavering confidence. Above all, I am confident that our team will do what is necessary with appropriate rigor to deliver this system to our soldiers. I am so proud to be part of this team and an immensely, an, am immensely grateful for the significant time and energy that our collective teams have poured into supporting this mission. We appreciate the support we have received for these programs from Congress and from this committee. Your, your support and receptiveness to our efforts is paramount to our success, and I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant General White. Chairman Lambor, Ranking Member Moulton, and distinguished members of this subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on the Department of the Air Force's hypersonic programs. Our continued efforts to develop and field an operational hypersonic air launch weapon will enable us to hold high value time-sensitive targets at risk in contested environments from standoff distances. A hypersonic weapon in concert with a wider weapons force mix is key to providing a war-winning Air Force. The Air Force's hypersonic portfolio consists of three major thrusts, boost glide missiles, air breathing cruise missiles, and the foundational science and technology s and hypersonics portfolio. Starting with Aero, our boost glide missile is the air-launched rapid response weapon. We are undergoing the final test of the all-up round with a planned test program completion by the end of second quarter fiscal year 2024. This test will launch a full prototype of the operational hypersonic missile and is focused on the Aero's end-to-end -end performance. While future Aero decisions are pending final analysis of all flight test data, the service is pleased to report that the Aero rapid prototyping program has been a categorical success to date. Next, Hackam. Our air-breathing cruise missile is the hypersonic attack cruise missile. It is an air-launched, air-breathing weapon that can be integrated on current and future fighters, as well as provide expanded capacity on bombers. The Air Force awarded the Hackam contract in September of 2022 and is developing the weapon using the Middle Tier Acquisition Rapid Prototyping Authority. We are working to mature Hackam to critical design, along with other development activities to enable the flight test activities in fiscal year 2025. Science and technology, in collaboration with the wider hypersonics community, our foundational science and technology hypersonics portfolio is executed by the Air Force Research Laboratory. AFRL has made many enduring contributions, contributions to the field of hypersonics to date. They achieved significant successes with their recently completed high-speed strike weapon technology maturation program. This program transitioned over 30 technologies to various DOD hypersonic programs, ranging from advanced materials to propulsion technologies to vehicle designs. Based on these successes, we look forward to the launch of TechMAT-2 to further develop and transition technologies for next-generation hypersonic capabilities. In fiscal year 2025, 
The focus of the Air Force Research Laboratory technology development efforts will shift to less mature technologies that are needed to develop future reusable hypersonic platforms, which will provide multi-mission intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, as well as strike capabilities. I thank you again for the opportunity to testify and provide additional details in the, class, in the classified session later today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Mr. McCormick. Chairman Lamborn, Ranking Member Moulton, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the invitation to provide the De Defense Intelligence Enterprise assessment of China's and Russia's hypersonic weapon systems. I'm a senior intelligence analyst with the National Air and Space Intelligence Center here on behalf of DIA. Our competitors are developing advanced weapon capabilities aimed at holding U.S. forward deployed forces and the homeland at risk. Hypersonic weapons are designed to evade U.S. sensors and defensive systems, and they provide an adversary military commanders with unique capabilities. These weapons pose an increasing and complex threat due to availability of both nuclear and conventional capabilities. U.S. competitors are developing multiple configurations and types of hypersonic missiles that can be tailored for employment from air, ground, and sea launchers. Both China and Russia have conducted numerous successful tests of hypersonic weapons and fielded operational capabilities. Russia has used these against Ukraine, but China is ahead of Russia in support infrastructure and total inventory. China's missile programs are comparable to top-tier producers internationally, and China leads Russia with its hypersonic arsenal. China's progress is resulting from its efforts over the past two decades to dramatically advance its capability in conventional and nuclear-armed hypersonic missile technologies. This has been done through intense and focused investment, development, testing, and now deliveries to the PLA. China has an extensive and robust research and development infrastructure, and PRC researchers have claimed these facilities help expose critical engineering and technology issues before missiles are tested. China is also expanding research into reusable high-speed vehicles. China has demonstrated a high pace of flight testing for its hypersonic systems. This emphasis is enabling China to deploy weapons, including the DF-17, uh, that has an estimated range of at least 1,600 kilometers, enabling it to reach U.S. military basing and fleet assets in Western Pacific. Since 2014, China has conducted several tests in pursuit of an intercontinental range hypersonic glide vehicle. Uh, China is pursuing this capability in part due to long-term concerns about U.S. defenses and a desire for parity with the future worldwide missile capabilities. China's investments will enable it to deploy large numbers of hypersonic weapons in line with its plans for a strong and modernized rocket force. China also is advancing advanced high-speed engine or scramjet technologies that have applications in hypersonic cruise missiles. Russia has performed research on hypersonic weapon technologies since at least the 1980s and currently has three deployed hypersonic systems. The first is the air launch Kinjal. It has a claimed top speed of Mach 10 and over a reach of over 2,000 kilometers, and Russia has used this extensively against Ukraine with varying degrees of success and effectiveness. Uh, the other, another weapon is the SS-19, or Avangard, hypersonic glide vehicle. Uh, Russian officials claim this has uh, capability to fly over Mach 20 and a range of up to 10,500 kilometers. The third system, the Sircon, is a ship launch hypersonic missile that travels at speeds up to Mach 8. Re Ukraine reported recovering components of the Sircon, indicating it has also been used operationally earlier this year. And Russia has declared its intentions to continue developing and deploying hypersonic weapons, including another air launch hypersonic long-range missile called the Ka-95. My goal in this hearing is to help Congress and the nation better understand the threats that advanced hypersonic weapons pose to our forward deployed forces and the homeland. The Defense Intelligence Enterprise aims to support the committee in identifying opportunities to respond to these challenges. Thank you for your continued confidence, and we are grateful for your vital support. Okay, thank you to the very distinguished panel of witnesses for each of your statements. We'll now have one round of questions from the panel, and then we'll go into our classified remainder of our hearing upstairs. Uh, for both Dr. Horowitz and Mr. McCormick, in the hands of the Chinese, are hypersonic weapons able to do something that none other of their weapons can do? I can take that to start. So uh, China is very invested in long-range strike and precision strike capabilities. Uh, the, they have looked at missiles for a, a long time to, to achieve their strategic goals, and hypersonics is, is really a continuation of, of that commitment to a long-range missile force for counter-intervention 
in strategic nuclear deterrence. Thanks so much. The, I think that that's right. The only thing I would add is that we have concern about the hypersonics being developed by uh, the PRC uh, and Russia, uh, given the, their potential for dual capable systems, where there may be ambiguity about whether a system is armed with a nuclear or conventional weapon. Those are the kinds of situations where the deployment of hypersonic weapons is more likely to have destabilizing effects during a crisis or a conflict. And that is also not a concern with the hypersonic weapons that the United States is developing. So is it your position that hypersonics have capabilities that no other weapons have? So they combine the benefits of ballistic missiles, which are high speed, and cruise missiles, which are maneuverable. And so uh, they, they, you, you can get those effects with two different types of weapons, but what they, they really challenge are, are uh, sensing capability uh, and, and our defensive capability. And they do provide military commanders very rapid response uh, capability um, that, that you wouldn't have necessarily with, with other weapons. And this is why we're pursuing hypersonics in the first place. The, the combination of speed, range, and maneuverability means they have the potential to generate effects that in combination with the other capabilities the joint force is developing give us the ability to deter aggression and, if necessary, prevailing conflict. I think it's a straw man argument to say that we would pursue a type of weapon class only because the other side is doing it. I think that there is a use for hypersonics in and of themselves, no matter whether anyone else is doing it or not, and whether they're ahead of us or behind us. Would you both gentlemen agree with that statement? I think that the, the Department of Defense is well aware of Russia and the PRC's activities in hypersonics, uh, but the United States is not developing hypersonic weapons to respond to Russian or Chinese development of hypersonic systems. We are developing you know, hypersonics, you know, as you suggest, because we think that their development and deployment is necessary to enhance the capabilities of the joint force and our ability to implement the national defense strategy. We think that the development of hypersonic systems will support integrated deterrence against priority threats because of that intersection of speed, maneuverability, and range uh, that they have. It helps give senior decision makers uh, the full range of options, especially in a contested battlefield environment where an adversary has deployed uh, anti-access area denial systems. Thank you. Mr. McCormick. I certainly can't speak to the U.S. strategy. I would just say that, that China views these as an extension of its desire for precision long-range strike and to also uh, enhance the credibility of its, its nuclear deterrence. These are, these are in line with strategies that it's developed for uh, its ICBMs, its, its uh, IRBMs, MRBMs, and, and cruise missiles, and so they extend that strategy. Okay, thank you. Now, here's a question for General Rash, Vice Admiral Wolf, and Lieutenant General White. Can you talk about how your teams are working to overcome recent testing challenges and what problem is on your critical path? Thank you for the question, Congressman. Um, since the three uh, events this last year, uh, non-flight test activities, uh, the team has doubled down um, during the time we've had available to, uh, to really take a deep dive look into some of the, the system design aspects while we're refitting uh, missiles to get back out to the range. So this has been a time for us, uh, both Army and Navy, uh, to develop some lines of effort where we do a complete system analysis, ensuring that we've, uh, we uncover any additional trouble spots other than what we found to date, uh, as well as um, uh, standing up an independent review team to actually come in and look over our shoulder and to make sure we haven't missed something in the past. And we can go into more details on the, the test activity during our closed session. Vice Admiral Wolf. Yes, sir, that's exactly right. And as we work with the Army, certainly what, what General Rash is doing on his side and what we're doing on our side together to understand, um, obviously, both of these programs have been very fast-paced, and we've really leaned into ranking member Moulton's point 
of understanding the risks that we were taking to try and get this capability out there rapidly. Um, we've hit some hiccups and we're learning from that. So we will, to General Rash's point, we can talk about some additional testing we believe that we need to do to get some more confidence as we in parallel push this entire system forward. So um, again, a lot of these have been just understanding how we, how we actually put this in the warfighters' hands. It's not necessarily a technology challenge, it's a ramping up industry to produce these things reliably so that we can give them to our warfighter. Thank you, General White. Yeah, I would say something similar, Congressman. The, the, the challenge, we've had some pretty good success with some of our tests over the recent past, and so I do think there is a part of this that is learning. Many of these, these programs, as you know, are somewhat from a, born out of science and technology, and so we continue to learn as we go through the process. I think taking the time, as uh, um, General Rashid pointed out, taking the time, good system engineering and design, and making sure we're taking into consideration as we have these programs, because many of them are middle, middle tier acquisitions, and we're moving quickly with these technologies, so continue to stay focused on that design and engineering piece. And then, of course, it's absolutely critically important that we continue to test. Thank you. And Mr. Rumford, from your seat at TRMC, what is the biggest bottleneck right now when it comes to hypersonic testing, and how are you working to address that? So the two biggest uh, bottlenecks, and, and thank you for that question, it's, it's, it's the most important focus that we have is improving our flight test capacity and our ground test capacity. We need both of those. Testing is essential to understanding how well these weapons work. Uh, you can't think a weapon into existence, but you can test a weapon into existence, and so it's essential to kind of understand how those weapons perform. Every capability that we've ever put in air or into space, we've had ground test infrastructure that enables us to understand how well it works. So we have significant investments going on the ground test side to better understand the material science and the propulsion systems, and as well as improving our, our high-speed test tracks. And then on the flight test side, we have three major initiatives that are going to change our posture in our nation. One is the Mach-TB program that the Navy mentioned already, which is really going to be able to improve our throughput of hypersonic tests. Secondly is the Sky Range program, which is retrofitting UAVs so we can test hypersonics in more locations. And then thirdly, a corridor initiative to be able to have more long-range corridors. All of those couplings, I think, take on this challenge of how do we improve our ability to test for our nation. Very good. And lastly, Dr. Weber, are you all at OSD using this delay as we work through the testing issues to make sure that the production capabilities will be there and that we'll be able to produce at scale when necessary? Uh, thank you for the question, sir. So certainly we are making significant investments in our industrial base. So we are using our authorities and programs in manufacturing technology, industrial base analysis and sustainment, and Defense Production Act Title III to improve our manufacturing technologies, but also to improve our manufacturing capability and capacity with industry and to ensure that we have a resilient industry base. Thank you. Ranking Member Moulton. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I wasn't quite sure if you were going to call me Ranking Member or Mr. Strawman, but... Uh, ranking Member. Look, I support a lot of big weapons investments. Uh, in fact, I've even been accused of being a defense hawk, which is not always a compliment rarely a compliment in my party. So look, if you can answer some of these basic foundational questions with confidence, questions I've been asking for three years now, then you have every right and a very good chance of, of changing my mind. But I'm asking these basic questions because I haven't been able to get simple answers to these simple questions. Now look, a congressman recently decided to link, leak the fact that Russia is developing a nuclear space weapon. Uh, Dr. Horowitz, do we have a plan to develop our own nuclear space weapon to the TURDIS development? Here to talk, we're here to talk about conventional hypersonics. From yes, my question is, do we have a plan to develop a nuclear space weapon to deter the Russians' recently leaked development of such a weapon? Not as far as I know, but I'm happy to take that for the record. Well, I would love to see it for the record if the, if the answer changes. So the point is that we don't plan to develop one just to deter a weapon because our adversary has it. There are a lot of other examples of this. For example, we developed blinding lasers and we decided that that's probably not a great thing to subject our infantry to. So years ago, we, through diplomacy, achieved an agreement that's been upheld even by our adversaries not to use blinding lasers on the battlefield. In fact, you could, make, you could say this about just about every other major weapon system that has been canceled since DOD established, was established. 
that even though our adversaries have some things, we don't necessarily develop them ourselves, and we know that's a long list. Now, the chairman said in his comments about my opening statement that hypersonics provide the only way to get to certain targets. So, gentlemen, does that mean that there are targets today that we don't have the means to strike? Admiral Wolf. Sir, that's difficult to answer in an open forum. As we talked about, um, I'm prepared in the closed session to walk you through, at least from a Navy perspective, some of the things that, w that went into our initial capability document requirements and also went into the other requirements that we're developing our system specifically for. So if I could take that question in the uh, classified forum, I'd be happy to, to go further into that. Sure, okay, that sounds good, I'll look forward to it. Dr. Horowitz, the foundation of nuclear deterrence is through the concept of mutually assured destruction. We know that if we launch a bunch of ICBMs from missile fields out west that we can expect the exact same thing in return, and that's what's prevented either us or Russia from doing so. Russia and China have been very clear that they are developing hypersonic missiles as a strategic deterrent, equipping them with nuclear weapons to evade our homeland missile defense systems. And this is why you said that Adversary systems, which are dual capable, conventional or nuclear, are strategically destabilizing. And I want to emphasize the fact that you said that in your testimony. If we detected a salvo of hypersonics coming our way, something we can't do today, by the way, but we're hopefully able to soon, how would we respond? We have establish processes and procedures for how the department would make that decision and whether the, whether the how and when the United States would respond and in what time frame would be a decision that uh, senior military leaders or the president would make and happy to talk about that more in the closed session. Well, let me just pause it that we've been very clear and very public about the fact that if we see a whole bunch of nuclear tipped ICBMs coming our way, we're going to respond with the same thing and that's what prevents Russia from doing it. So I think we might want to consider being pretty public in saying if you have a whole bunch of hypersonics coming our way and a big salvo like that, we would have a similar response because that's how we deter it from happening. And if not, we are in a strategically destabilizing situation. So let me ask you this. What will China do if they see a salvo of hypersonic missiles headed their way that they think might carry nuclear warheads? So we think that that's the difference between the hypersonic weapons that we're developing and the hypersonic weapons that, that they're developing, and that the, because their systems are dual capable, that's why we think they potentially increase the risk of instability. Because we are only acquiring conventional hypersonics and have been very clear about the way that we've messaged that, we think that it'd be, it, you know, it'd be a lot less likely that, that any, any country, including the PRC, would view uh, shots of U.S. hypersonic systems as potentially carrying nuclear weapons because we are not developing nuclear-armed hypersonics. Well, I agree that we think that. Mr. McCormick, from an intelligence perspective, do China or Russia, does China or Russia have any doubt that our hypersonics program is not developing dual-capable systems that could be equipped with nuclear weapons? Uh, I think we sh I, I would prefer to take that in the closed session. Well, let me tell you, if you can't answer that here, I think we know what the answer is. So it's great that we think our hypersonics are not strategically destabilizing, even though you have admitted that our adversaries' hypersonics are. But it doesn't matter what we think in this situation. It matters what Russia or China thinks, because if we launch a bus bunch of hypersonics into China to get at targets that we want to get in China, and they think, or they even might think, that that salvo has nuclear weapons on it, that they can't even tell where they're going because that's the whole point of hypersonics, right? They could be going to, to purely military targets, but they won't know that because the whole point of hypersonics is they can veer over and hit Beijing or whatever else at the last minute. That's the whole point of this weapon system. That does not sound very strategically stabilizing to me. Dr. Horowitz, if we actually do receive the answer to the simple question of how you plan to use these weapons uh, in December as promised, can you just explain why it's taking so long to get a simple answer to this simple question? I'll have to take that back. I think from our perspective, there are a couple, you can't of, explain. There are a couple of ways to think about this. The, 
One is because these weapon systems are still in, are still in development, the concepts of operation for their potential employment are also still in development. Which is exactly contradicting the advice that we gave to the department through the Bipartisan Future Defense Task Force report, which is not to go spend billions of dollars of taxpayer money developing weapons that you don't ha know how to use. Okay, continue. The department, whenever it develops new, new weapon systems, develops concepts for develops concepts of employment for their use, but the specifics regarding those concepts of deployment, I think some of the details that you're really, that you're really looking for are the kinds of details that the department has for, for any weapon system when, the, when, those capabilities, when those capabilities transition. Certainly the department has spent some time thinking about possibilities in this regard that we can talk about in the closed session. Well, I'm delighted to know that $15 billion later, the department is thinking about possibilities for how you will use these weapons. We certainly hope to have an answer by December. I rest my case. <clears throat> Representative Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Indeed, uh, it is bipartisan. I want to thank the ranking member, Seth Moulton, for his uh, passion today and his service. And uh, with his military background, he is a person who, uh, in a bipartisan manner, we look forward to working with you. Uh, also, I want to uh, thank the uh, extraordinary panel here today. Um, Chairman Hal uh, uh, Lambert is doing a great job. Uh, we've never had seven witnesses simultaneously. So, um, so thank you. It's uh, really an achievement. Mr. McCormick, with the war crime of Putin's invasion of Ukraine, we observed the assistance of the Democratic People's Republic of North Korea and Iran have provided. With the alliance of dictators with rule of gun invading democracies with rule of law, it's concerning to see the cooperation among our adversaries and the Western civilization adversaries. Is there evidence that suggests that the axis of evil, war criminal Putin, the regime in Tehran, and the Chinese Communist Party are cooperating in the development of hypersonic missiles, exchanging technologies or collaboration within their own industrial base? Yes, I'd like to reference the uh, uh, testimony of the Director of National Intelligence either earlier today or earlier this week uh, that, that did talk about the increasing collaboration uh, between those uh, those actors. Uh, I think on hypersonics, it's still to be seen exactly w what collaboration may may occur, but we are very concerned about uh, the increasing uh, ties between those uh, those adversaries. And uh, indeed, too, uh, Dr. Weber, it's critical that the United States cooperate as we see the axis of evil cooperating with their foreign partners in the development of hypersonic missiles and share the cost in developing hypersonic programs. Expanding hypersonic program efforts with our foreign partners, such as NATO partner Sweden and uh, South Korea, would undoubtedly strengthen our ability to deter foreign adversaries. We know firsthand of the technological industrial capabilities of South Korea, and which is well represented here in Washington, by Ambassador Hyung Dong Cho. Additionally, yesterday was historic and something that uh, America and the world should recognize, and that is that the formal admission of Sweden into NATO and uh, ending 200 years of neutrality. The Swedish industrial capabilities are crucial to establishing peace through strength. Swedish Prime Minister Olaf Christensen deposited the instrument of accession March 7th to join with NATO, and indeed, Sweden is capably represented here in Washington by Ambassador uh, Urban Allen. And so uh, this is a time that we should be working together, and we do have the extraordinary example of the trilateral security partnership between Australia, the United States, and the United Kingdom, and our bilateral plan with other partners. And so, uh, indeed, uh, Dr. Weber, is the United States looking to expand cooperation with other foreign partners in the development of our hypersonic and counter hypersonic programs? Thank you for the question, sir. Certainly that is one of our highest priorities is to establish allied partnerships to develop hypersonic and counter hypersonic capabilities. As you noted, we are working very hard with our uh, UK and Australia counterparts under the AUKUS framework to identify collaboration opportunities there, for, again, for both hypersonics and counter hypersonics. We're also working very closely with Norway, and we've had introductory discussions with a number of countries as well. And just, just, it's just so mutually beneficial, and uh, the best way, and we, I was really pleased 
Uh, the, you correct me, the first hypersonic uh, missile attack that I'm aware of uh, was on Ukraine, on the civilian population of Ukraine. Uh, and fortunately, somehow, I don't know how it was done, but it was taken down. And so whatever uh, capabilities, uh, and sadly we can see from uh, the invasion of uh, Ukraine, the invasion of uh, Israel, uh, that we need to be developing capabilities. And we have um, now a real world uh, situations that should be addressed. And uh, over and over again, uh, it's just uh, inconceivable in the 21st century that we have a land war in Europe, that we have mass slaughter uh, in Israel, and then we have the threats and challenge to the people of Taiwan. And I hope every effort is made uh, to uh, preserve the borders of Ukraine, of uh, Israel, Taiwan, and America. And we look forward to working uh, with each of you. I yield back. Thank you. Representative Garamendi. Uh, first, uh, thank you very much. Extremely important hearing. Thank you for uh, bringing it to our attention and for all of the uh, witnesses here. Uh, there's a lot of dancing around some fundamental questions that have gone on here. I recall not too long ago we had a long, long debate about the LSRO, whether it was conventional or nuclear, and I think it's probably currently dual capable. And now uh, Mr. Moulton has raised the question once again of uh, this new system, is it nuclear or is it conventional? And uh, Mr. Horowitz, you danced around this question. I want to put it to you very directly. Can you confirm at this public hearing on the record that we are not developing this new system, this hypersonic system, for nuclear capability, and that it is only for conventional. The only hypersonic weapons the United States is developing are conventional weapons. And not, not nuclear. Not nuclear weapons. Thank you. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the capabilities of the hypersonic and its effectiveness and the effect that it has on a particular target. I think this is what Mr. Moulton wanted to get to, and I guess that'll be in the classified setting. Uh, the witnesses here have raised the questions about the use of a ballistic missile with a maneuverable warhead. General White, I think you did this specifically with your testimony with regard to the Hackam. A Hackam with a maneuverable warhead. What, how does that differ in its effect with a hypersonic weapon that also is maneuverable? I can certainly uh, take that question. I don't believe it was me that referred to it. I believe it was Mr. McCormick in his testimony. But bottom line is, is the, the point he was making in his testimony, essentially what a hypersonic weapon is, is essentially a, a cruise missile with ballistic capabilities. If you want to add to that, I'll. Sure. I'll, I'll just add that our, our adversaries are looking at a broad variety of systems, some closer to ballistic missiles, some closer to cruise missiles, and they, they, there's a very large design space that they're exploring, and each of those bring different challenges to defending against. Uh, and so when we say hypersonic system, there's actually a lot of diversity even in, within that field of, of, of weapons that we uh, see being developed. I believe Lieutenant General Dale White, in your written testimony, as a self-powered cruise missile, Hackam provides complementary trajectories to boost glide systems such as the Arrow, which I understand to be a hypersonic, imposing additional cost on the strategic competitors by increasing the complexity. Yes, sir. What I was referring to there it is is that uh, um, the hypersonic attack cruise missile is a cruise missile that has speed, range, and maneuverability, like we talked about. And so that is the focus of, of, of that particular capability. And how does that differ from a hypersonic? So it's exactly it's what Mr. Effective. McCormick said. The, the, the dependence on how, and I can't go into too much detail here, all hypersonics are t technically not created equal in terms of from a technology perspective, but I can certainly go into greater detail, and I think I plan to during the closed session. Well, the, the GAO suggests that a um, 
hypersonic is about 17 billion, and a cruise missile or a standard missile with a maneuverable warhead is about one-third less to achieve the same effect. Anybody disagree with that analysis? So I think that analysis has to be highly contingent on, on how many you're buying, for example. <laughs> Doesn't everything. Yeah, the, so the, the greater quantity would, would be a determination. I know there was some questioning from Dr. LaPlante and, and uh, the Honorable Shu early on about the, the cost of, of weapons. And so we sent over an RFI that basically laid out some of the details on that. And, and quantities have a significant impact over the overall cost. But in comparison, uh, there is... The more you buy, the cheaper they are per unit. Yes, sir. That is correct. And the total cost? Uh, I'm going to yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Desjardins. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I know the Chairman's already discussed ground test infrastructure a little bit, and you addressed some of the bottlenecks, but I wanted to go just uh, maybe a step further with uh, Dr. Weber and Mr. Uh, Rumford. Uh, we know it's a painstaking uh, process to modernize aging uh, ground test infrastructure, but it's picked up speed over the last decade due to bipartisan efforts in this committee as well as the work done within your department. Can you give the committee an assessment of our ground test infrastructure today? Are we moving fast enough, and what areas of improvement remain? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, the, uh, we are investing heavily, and thank you for the support for the investments needed in our ground test infrastructure. As I said earlier, it's essential to be able to understand how well these weapon systems work. Uh, I will also say replicating the hypersonic flight environment on a, in a ground facility is extremely complicated. And so there's a lot of challenges to be able to make that happen. So these, these facilities are uh, complicated to design. I, I will say that um, while we have a whole nation approach and we're looking at both capabilities that are in the private sector and in academia as well as our allied nations, um, we are also very focused on improvements with our own uh, organic DOD uh, test capabilities. Our crown jewel in DOD ground test is at the Arnold Engineering Development Complex in Middle Tennessee. Uh, these are the engineers and scientists that helped us win the space race, helped us win the Cold War, and they're helping us win in this competition that we're, we're facing. Um, we, as you mentioned, taking aging instrumentation uh, and aging facilities and modernizing them uh, uh, is, that does have limitations and challenges to it. That is why we've also embarked on some new facilities. We have two new facilities being developed in Tennessee at, at the Arnold Engineering Development Complex uh, to get after and better understand hypersonics, both in material testing which is essential to understand and improve the maneuverability and the range of the weapon is how well that aero shell works on that weapon system, as well as the, for an air breathing cruise missile, how well that propulsion system works and how we can better characterize the uncertainties of that, of that uh, test regime. And so uh, we, we are making major investments and with the continued support of, of Congress, we will continue to accelerate and, and improve the bottlenecks that we currently have. Okay. For the sake of time, Dr. Weber, uh, or, or either of you, uh, you, you were kind enough to meet with me last week in my office, and you all highlighted an inter interesting issue uh, surrounding the flexibility that would be helpful in expediting these modernization efforts, uh, particularly with some of the supply chain issues and some of these construction materials and replacement parts that have long lead times. Can you briefly touch on how you're grappling with this issue within the department and how this committee can be helpful in this effort? Uh, thank you for the question, Congressman. So certainly, so we are making investments now to address those critical items that do have long lead times. We, when we work very closely with the program offices, the, the military acquisition programs that we've been talking about, and they start looking ahead to production. You know, we learn from them what are the, the, what are the long lead items that would delay the production or slow the production rate down. So we're making investments in the department to address that. So we are, we are bringing on uh, new industry to expand our industrial base. Uh, to in increase their capacity and also give us the resilience that we need. Okay. And I have a minute and a half, Dr. Weber. Uh, when she Secretary Shu appeared before this committee last month, we briefly talked about the value of reusable hypersonics. Uh, can you describe in a minute or less the concept of reusable hypersonics aircraft and what it will mean for our ability to project force over China and how will this capability allow us to overwhelm Chinese anti-access aerial denial capabilities for critical ISR and strike missions? Certainly. Thank you for the question. Yes, sir. So we are looking at reusable hypersonic aircraft for responsive strike and ISR missions. So we're currently some 
conducting studies to understand the military utility of that. And we were also doing some work at the science and technology level to address the, the critical technologies that we would need to burn down in order to move to the next phase for an activity or program like that. Okay. And I will yield back. Thank you. Mr. Vasquez, Representative Vasquez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to all the witnesses before the subcommittee to discuss this very important topic. I proudly represent New Mexico's 2nd Congressional District, home to Holloman Air Force Base and White Sands Missile Range, the birthplace of America's missile and space program. Uh, New Mexico's testing and manufacturing capabilities are critical in keeping the United States at the forefront of innovation, and there's no better place to display those capabilities than at Holloman. Uh, Dr. Weber, the high-speed test track at Holloman Air Force Base is one of the Department of Defense's most valuable tools to test and evaluate hypersonic weapons in a safe, controlled, and cost-effective manner. Unfortunately, like many pieces of critical defense infrastructure, the test track for years has been in critical needs of significant updates. What steps is the department taking to modernize the test track, and how important is it to maintain critical test and evaluation infrastructure like that found in Holloman uh, for the future of hypersonic testing in this country? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, the Holloman High Speed Test Track is a critical asset to our development of hypersonic weapons. We use it extensively for uh, warhead testing, lethality testing, uh, before we actually conduct those tests through flight tests, so it's a critical uh, enabler for us. Uh, we also use it to look at weather effects as well, to look at what are the weather effects or erosion effects on a, on a, on a hypersonic weapon. So. TRMC, I'll pass this to my colleague from TRC, but they're, they're looking at, um, you know, modifications or upgrades to the Holloman High Speed Test Track, so I'll just pass it to them. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, being able to replicate hypersonic flight on high speed test tracks is an essential ingredient to the success of developing hypersonic systems. So it is essential to have this uh, test capability. We, as, as Dr. Weber said, we are making some mod, uh, mod, modernization efforts and we are improving some things. But simply put, as a nation, we need a new track. Uh, when we modernize the track, we have to take the track offline for a period of time, which is the exact opposite of what we want to be doing while we're trying to go fast and take on more risk. So while we've been making some modernizations and trying to make sure that we don't impact the speed of testing, we are uh, studying and embarking upon a capability to build an, a, an additional new track so that we can have a better capability for our nation. The track we have now is 70 plus years old. It was originally designed to test ejection seats and airplanes, and over the years it was modified to be able to do things like test uh, faster systems and missile defense capabilities and lethality tests. But if we're really going to move after and get after um, testing hypersonics, we're going to need a new uh, track capability in our nation. Th thank you, Mr. Rumford. Thank you, Dr. Weber. Uh, and like a lot of military infrastructure, research and development infrastructure in New Mexico, a lot of it is 70 plus years old, uh, but yet we continue to be the nation's testing ground. Now, sure, we'll give you the, free, uh, the first free mile to space for free because we're at 5,500 feet of elevation, uh, but we need more in terms of de uh, investments from the Department of Defense in these critical facilities. Now, beyond the integral role that we play in testing hypersonic weapons, we're also a leader in manufacturing key components for hypersonic and other critical weapon systems. Uh, Dr. Weber, what would you say are the biggest challenges to the department uh, that they face in recruiting and retaining a workforce of well-trained civilians and contractors to meet the development and production demands at places like Holloman? Yes, sir. so thank you for the question. And that also is a, is a priority for us as workforce development. As a matter of fact, our Joint Hypersonic Transition Office uh, they are the lead for our workforce de development for hypersonics, for our hypersonics critical technology area. So it's important that we work very hard to attract the scientists, the, the STEM students, uh, as well as the technicians. So it's not just the scientists and engineers, but also the technicians as well and the skilled laborers who can help us with production. So we, through the University Consortium for Applied Hypersonics, for instance, we have, uh, we're funding research uh, with over 300 undergraduate students to get them training in science and, in science and technology associated with hypersonics. We're also working to establish internship programs for those students to come and work in government or industry labs. And then we also have outreach with community colleges and tech schools to try to attract the skilled laborers that, you know, they're, they're coming up in those uh, educational facilities to come work for us in hypersonics to support our production lines. Thank you so much, doctor. And again, uh, I've said it before, if you can test it in New Mexico, you should be able to design it and manufacture it in New Mexico, and you should be able to hire New Mexicans for this job. Uh, this is incredibly important to me, 
especially with some of the best and brightest students coming out of places like the University of New Mexico and New Mexico State University. Uh, thank you all for your service to our country for your time to discuss this important topic. And I yield back. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Representative Bacon. Thank you. Thanks for being here. It's a very important topic. Uh, Dr. Hor Horowitz and Dr. Weber, so China is putting nuclear warheads on the, the hypersonics. Do we have any evidence of Russia doing anything like that? Okay, I'll, maybe it could be someone else. Yes, th thank you for the question. Yes, we have uh, believe that both China and Russia are looking at conventional and nuclear armed hypersonic weapons. So then I go back to the, uh, the original two I was gonna ask, are we confident that it's not right for us to do the same? If Russia and China are putting nuclear warheads on hypersonic delivery systems, why isn't that we're not? And you, I know you mentioned a little bit because it's confusing, if it's a conventional warhead or a nuclear warhead, but it doesn't seem to be stopping the Russians or Chinese. So are we confident this is the right decision? I think that the department is confident in the, in the nuclear deterrent and you know, that's something that we could, you know, we could talk about further in a, in a, in a different session, you know, in a closed session, but I think the department has, has every confidence, you know, in the triad and is making tremendous investments to ensure the modernization of the triad we view hypersonic weapons in particular as most useful as regionally ranged conventionally armed systems because of the way we think that they enhance the capability of the joint force to, you know, com to complete a variety of different missions. So based on the expense of each delivery uh, vehicle, you mentioned this a little bit, what are the, what are the best targets to go after? Because they're, they're expensive, so you have to get a value, you have to hit a valuable target. So what is the right kind of targets? So, sir, uh, thank you for the question. We obviously can't talk about the specific targets or missions here in this session, but each of the systems that we're developing have different attributes. Uh, just like other weapons in our munitions portfolio or tools in your toolbox, they have different attributes that make them most suitable for, uh, for different missions, for various missions. And so that's why we're developing a suite of hypersonic capabilities. The suite of hypersonic capabilities that we're developing complement each other, and they complement the, re the rest of our joint force. Uh, the other thing that's important to understand is that we're developing capabilities that can be deployed from all of our, our domains, air, land, and sea, our air, land, and sea domain. And that's important as well because that complicates the adversary's decision calculus, which increases the deterrence effect, and it also makes it more difficult for the adversary to defend against. But just my concern is that the expense of each weapon, you have to have very particular high-value targets that make sense. It's like shooting, us shooting Patriot missiles at you know, a 122 millimeter rocket or something. It's gotta make sure it's worth the value. Yeah. So talk about the air, land, and sea domains. Who determines the right mix? Because if I understand right, the air launched portion is actually fairly, it's less expensive because it's easy to configure the hypersonic to the airplanes already. But with the surface ships, the subs, and the ground, you have to deliver or develop the whole launcher, which I think is a lot, adds a lot of price tag to it. So how do we determine the right mix? Yes, sir. So ultimately, that, that is determined through the recommendations in our uh, program and budget review that we conduct each year in the Department of Defense. So in our program and budget review, there are a number of studies and analysis that inform that, uh, studies mm -hmm. and analysis performed by the joint staff, by CAPE, by acquisition and sustainment research and engineering and the services. Uh, so we bring together a number of studies and analysis to inform what are the capability gaps that we have, what are the, what are the needs, uh, what are the solutions that we have to address those needs, and we address those collectively through our program and budget review, which are which result in recommendations that ultimately end up in the president's budget. Okay, finally, and I got a quick question for General White. Secretary Kendall recently noted that the Air Force is more committed to the hypersonic attack cruise missile instead of the air-launched rapid response weapon. But yet, I think we're still testing both. What is what is the air, uh, the service position uh, on which one, or is it both? So right now, uh, we, we are still in the final phases of Arrow, and we will be testing that. We'll be wrapping that testing up second quarter of 24. And then again, we, when we're in the classified session, I can go into a little bit of detail about the difference between those two capabilities specifically, and it will highlight, uh, again, what characteristics you need based on the mission set. So both weapon systems still may be in play? Uh, currently, right now, we, we do not have the, the Arrow in the 25 budget. Okay. However, we are continuing to analyze the, the test data that we have from that, that capability. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate it. I yield. Thank you. Representative Carbajal. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all seven witnesses. I think this is a record for the amount of witnesses at one of the hearings I've attended. Uh, fielding our own uh, hypersonics capability seem to be eluding us, even as our peer adversaries are finding success in this technology. This is a technology that might cost the taxpayers billions without delivering the intended result. But it is a technology we need to continue pursuing to keep pace with China and Russia and to allow ourselves to better understand the threat. I think research is critical to understanding and deploying new, any new and emerging capability. Our nation is lucky to have some of the top universities in the world leading cutting edge research. Cal Poly San Luis Obispo is in my district and it is working with the Air Force Research Laboratory on building a Ludwig tube wind tunnel capable of Mach 6 to conduct hypersonic research. Dr. Weber or Dr. Horowitz, can you speak to the importance of university re research plays in supporting the development of capabilities like hypersonics? And do you think it is important for the department to continue these type of research partnerships? Thank you for the, thank you for the question, Congressman. Uh, our universities are one of our asymmetric cap uh, edges. Uh, they're very important to developing our hypersonic capabilities. They bring the, the best and the brightest ideas and scientists and engineers uh, into, the, into the ecosystem that we need for, to develop hypersonic systems. Uh, as I mentioned before, with the Joint Hypersonic Transition Office, we established the University Consortium. We have uh, over 100 universities in that University Consortium and that we're funding to do applied research. So one of the key things about this University Consortium is that uh, we are working with them to, to conduct applied research in addition to the basic research that's funded by our service labs. So that partnership is, is key. Again, it's, our, it's one of our asymmetric advantages that we have. And the relationships with the universities are also important for developing, identifying and developing those next generation capabilities as well. Dr. Horowitz. Absolutely. I, I agree with Dr. Weber completely. Our universities are an enormous comparative advantage and our investment, our investment in them and the knowledge they produce has been critical to the military technological edge that we've enjoyed for decades and hope to, hope to continue to enjoy, uh, whether in hypersonics or in other areas. Your answers would have been perfect if you said the best universities are in my district, but uh, <laughs> one potential way to drive down costs of hypersonic systems is to make them reusable. Dr. Weber, can you describe the concept of a reusable hypersonic aircraft and what it will mean for our ability to, to project force over China? How would this capability allow us to thwart or overwhelm Chinese anti-access area deniable, denial capabilities for critical ISR and strike missions? Thank you for the, thank you for the question. So a reusable hypersonic aircraft would, would take off and land on a conventional runway just like any other aircraft, but it would accelerate to hypersonic speeds and cruise at hypersonic speeds to perform missions. The missions that we've identified would be responsive strike and ISR, so it, it would be, give us the ability to deliver effects and to collect ISR, ISR very quickly, uh, much quicker than our traditional bomber forces would. Thank you. Dr. Weber, can you describe the timetable for development of reusable hypersonic aircraft, and what are some of the key technology development targets you're looking at? Thank you. So we are currently uh, addressing uh, critical technologies for hypersonic aircraft. Um, with reusable aircraft, one of the key differences between uh, that system or that application and, say, a weapon, of course, are the reusable structures. So there's a, a lot of work that we have to do in the science and technology world to address the materials and structures for a reusable hypersonic aircraft. Also, the propulsion systems are, are different in the sense that they're combined propulsion system as opposed to single uh, a single type of propulsion system. So reusable materials and structures, propulsion systems, power generation is another key technology. Thank you. In 2018, Congress recognized uh, hypersonics was one of the six key technologies in the Office of Undersecretary of Defense and Research and Engineering was established to drive the te technological development required to secure the homeland and warfighter deployed abroad. Mr. Weber, how confident Confident are you that we are on track to lead on this technology? And if we are not there yet, what will it take to get there? So thank you, Congressman. So I'm confident that, this, that we can deliver this technology and this capability into the hands of the warfighter. It's important for us to maintain our national will and our national commitment to this area. We have made good progress, and we are at the threshold of de delivering capabilities to the warfighter in the next couple of years. 
Thank you. I thought I'd ask you some softball today since you were getting grilled earlier. Uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I'll yield back. <clears throat> Thank you. Representative Strong. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank each of you for being here today. Uh, as I've said many times before, Huntsville, Alabama is no stranger to hypersonics. I'm thankful for the chance to have this discussion uh, with all of you today and especially glad to see one of Redstone Arsenal's own here today, Lieutenant uh, General Rash. Welcome. Uh, the standard of excellence and dedication to the mission set by Rick Toe should be an example for the entire department. Dr. Weber, uh, I also appreciate you taking the time to stop by my office last week. My first question is for you, General Rash and Admiral Wolf. The Navy uh, conventional prompt strike CPS and Army long range hypersonic weapons program were uh, structured to go into production earlier than traditional mis missile development programs uh, once the flight test phase is complete. Do you believe the CPS and the LRHW uh, will uh, complete their flight test phase this year? Thank you for the question and um, it is good to be here. The, absolutely, uh, we're doing everything we need to do uh, within both the Navy program and the Army program with our industry partners uh, to get ready to continue on with our flight test program this year. Thank you. Can you briefly uh, speak to how the joint nature of these programs uh, has contributed toward their success thus far? Yeah, I'll take that one to start. I, I would say, sir, as we've talked about in the past, this is a program that I think is unique to some of the things we've done in the Department of Defense. Um, although we're not a joint program, um, as General Rash and I have talked many times, we are so linked to a common success, which is a common all-up round, um, which we will deploy both in an art from an Army tail, from a Zumwalt, or from a, a Virginia class. That makes us very unique. And although we are budgeted separately, we run our individual portions separately, everything we do has to be done together because it's not one or the other being successful, it's both being successful. And I think that's driven us driven us to get to the point we've got, although arguably, yes, we've had some challenges, but I don't personally believe tradi a traditional program with one service doing it would be where we're collectively at today. I agree. Uh, last month, the press reported on a meeting between the Secretary of Defense and uh, the def defense industry asking companies, and I quote, to accelerate hypersonic weapon development uh, as U.S. lags behind China, close quote. While I agree with the sentiment and uh, glad the department is communicating with industry, uh, the principal way to do this is through contracts and funding, putting your money where your mouth is. Admiral Wolf and General Rash, do you believe the common hypersonic glide body program uh, has the manufacturing infrastructure and resources ready for production? Uh, Congressman, with, with uh, this, this uh, committee's support and Congress's support over the last several years, we have made the investments uh, in the common hyperglide body uh, in industrial base to support the requirements for the Army's program uh, in the near term and the Navy's program as well uh, with flexibility to scale up uh, in the out years as needed. Thank you. Would you uh, say in general these programs have gone faster and uh, cost less than typical missile, uh, uh, missile development programs? These, these programs, uh, CPS and LRHW, are significantly uh, faster, much more aggressive schedule than, uh, than traditional programs. I mean, we're five years, we're into the fifth year of, of this activity from the Army's perspective. Uh, traditional Army missile programs, anyway, are anywhere seven to ten years, so we're well ahead of schedule. Uh, cost, you know, it, it's expensive going fast. You pay a, you pay a price. Um, but, it, but then again, we're, we're seeing a lot of that up front. Uh, versus on a traditional program, it would be spread out over a longer period of time. Thank you. Mr. Rumford, our national hypersonics test infrastructure is in, inadequate to meet current and future demands of current and next generation hypersonic programs. Uh, how is the uh, Test uh, Resource Management Center balancing uh, investments across industry and academia um, to complement government facilities and accelerate testing and fielding of hypersonic weapons? Thank you for that question. Uh, we definitely need to have a whole nation approach for our test infrastructure. We have such of a bottleneck within our own government facilities. We're not going to be able to close the gaps our nation needs to if we only rely on government facilities. So we absolutely are partnering with the private sector and, and there are some very innovative approaches that they're taking that is giving us new opportunities to do testing. 
as well as looking at what, uh, what availability that we have in academia and academia uh, tunnels, as well as our allies equally also have hypersonic test capabilities. And we're looking to leverage all of those to be able to meet the gaps that we need to take, we need to uh, Thank cover. You. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. And last but not least, uh, we have the representative from Indiana, uh, Representative Banks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Rumford, what else do you need from Congress to scale the Mock TB program? So, Mock TB, and thank you for that question. Uh, Mock TB is actually a game changer to how we take things on. Um, if you look at traditional acquisition and what the, the three gentlemen to my left have to do is often when they're doing their all-up round tests, there's a whole set of components that are all being tested for the very first time. What MockTB is really broad is this game-changing approach that we have hypersonic flying test beds, things that we actually can't test in a ground test facility like a new radio system, a new comms link, we can test in a very reliable, repeatable type solution with MockTB. So MockTB is an essential solution that we're, we're, we want to move forward on. From, from a standpoint of support from Congress, absolutely is the approach of funding. We definitely need funding to be able to move forward and to scale the program to the size we need. From an authority standpoint, uh, we believe that we mostly have all the authorities that we have. One of the things that we're looking at when we use private sector activities is understanding that public-private relationship and who has the responsibility. So, for example, we, we're part of the Mock TB program is looking at leveraging commercial space ventures like VARTA that is launching into space, and then we're looking at using the reentry aspects as a hypersonic profile. Um, when we use commercial sector like that, private sector like that, understanding who has the insurance responsibility and understanding how that balance is, it's wonderful when things go right, but we need to be prepared when things go wrong. And, having, and so we're embarking on a new era of, of a public-private partnership, and that's where we'll seek support from Congress so we can really take Mock TB to the level that we need it to be. Okay, so, Thank you. So bear with me a little bit. If Congress increased funding, what could you do with it? If we gave you just flat funding, maybe what the president requested, what does that mean? Uh, either way, give, give, us, give the committee an idea of what, what more you could do with more money or what would happen if we so, so what we could do or decrease the funding. Thank you for the question, sir. What, what we could do with more funding, simply put, is more flights, and that's what we need. The, the, the uh, limited opportunity of flight test means that new technology developers have to wait, in some cases, months, if not years, to be able to get a, on a flight manifest to run. If we start having Mach TB flights much more frequently, and we're designing an infrastructure to be able to do 50 flights a year, suddenly you can now be in a mode where a technologist can be developing their technology at the fastest pace they can and ready to be able to go on a flight test as soon as it's available. It's, it's like having an airport that has a lot of opportunities to get flights or having an airport that flies an airplane once every three months. It's, we really need that flight volume up. Good way to put it. How would failing to meet the testing schedule harm other hypersonic programs? It, it, it's, it's like molasses to an engine. It slows everything down by not having that volume of flight uh, 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 throughput. So we absolutely want to be able to increase the number of flight tests that we can do. I really appreciate what you do. I think it's really important. I speak on behalf of uh, everyone in Indiana and in saying we would, it would be great to host you in Indiana at Naval Surface Warfare Center Crane. If you would be able to come, I, I, would, be, I would personally like to join you and show you the important work that's being done at Crane on behalf of all Hoosiers and everyone who is very proud of what's going on there. Absolutely. My, my father's a proud graduate of Purdue. My family's originally from Indiana. I would, be, I would welcome an opportunity to uh, take that visit. Mr. Sir. Chairman, we got him on the record. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to hosting him in Indiana. Um, we saw in the President's budget request yesterday that the fielding of the Navy's conventional prop strike missile has been delayed a year and that the Navy does not plan to buy any more CPS missiles in FY 2025. Vice Admiral Wolf, Wolf can you confirm that uh, this delay and budget cut is the result of the conventional prompt strike program's testing struggles and not the result of a decision by the Navy to deprioritize the missile? Yes, sir. So it's not, so we're not, we're not slowing down getting to Zumwalt. 
Okay. Um, yes, some of the issues that we've had have slowed down us getting into the Na into the Army fielding, which then the Navy falls behind that. But we are still all in, moving forward to get to Zumwalt as quickly as we can. That's first and foremost. That has not changed. Um, some of the some of the funding requests that you've seen have been a result of trying to balance the program and some budget instability, even as we've tried to understand across what we might get as an appropriation in 24, and then trying to understand where that would put us in 25 to get the entire program executed. So that's a round procurement issue. That's not a, a, a lack of wanting to get to every one of these platforms as rapidly as we can. Thank you, my time has expired. And Representative, you mentioned Crane, which is in Indiana, which does great work, and Purdue University. I've visited them as well, and they have excellent, a growing hypersonic uh, capability on campus. Uh, we are now ha have about to go to votes. They moved it up half an hour on us, so in about three minutes they're going to call votes, but they should be done roughly at 515. So as much as I wish we could do this before we head off to votes, we're going to have to take a recess for approximately 45 minutes and then reconvene at 515 for a closed session in the skiff upstairs. So thank you for your cooperation on that. We will now be in recess.